Today's sermon is brought to you free with limited commercial interruption. There was a time when I thought the Boy Scouts were the coolest thing. They looked so snappy in their uniforms, with their badges and their pins. They went hiking together and camping together, and they even had their own summer camp. I knew when I was old enough that I wanted to join. So I did, and that's when the problems began. <laughs> the first problem I encountered in the Scouts was that to be a member, you had to profess a belief in God. This came at a time when I was reconsidering everything about religion. I wasn't sure if I believed in God, but I decided to play along and I recited the memorized scout law and the oath. Though the scouts of that time talked about being open to everyone, the reality was that atheists, agnostics, or people of non-traditional faiths were discouraged from joining. It wasn't just religion that was an invisible barrier to acceptance in the troops, however. For example, being overweight, gender fluid, or from backgrounds different than the majority of the suburbanite membership may not have prevented one from joining the Scouts, but continued membership was often challenging. People who were different were shunned and silently encouraged to leave, and I was among the different. The religious thing I could keep hidden away, but there was one thing I could not hide. And I feel I must tell you about it now. I feel as your intern minister, I need to be open. I am short. <laughs> I know, I know. Take a minute, take a minute. I know. I, I know. Being short meant, and sometimes still means to people, that you are inadequate. I was picked on almost constantly by the other scouts, and sometimes even by the scout leaders. After a while, it became so unbearable, I quit. The point of this story is that the Boy Scouts of my youth would say they were accepting and welcoming of every young and at that time male person. But the reality was really quite different once you entered into the truth. If you thought differently, acted differently, looked different, or spoke differently, you could be silently or sometimes not so silently discouraged or dismissed. Now I know, as we already talked about with the Girl Scouts, that we have people in our congregation who are involved in scouting programs, and I am not talking about the Boy Scouts of today. The Scouts of my boyhood reflected the time. The modern Boy Scouts have come a long way to becoming more open and accepting. They are not even for boys anymore, just for boys. Other institutions in our culture have undergone similar changes. Unfortunately, some institutions have lagged behind in their expansion of acceptance. For example, churches, by their very nature, are conservative organizations, meaning they are slow to embrace change. This is true even of our own denomination, although I am proud to say that we have been in the forefront for much of the needed changes but we still have more work to do. We cannot just say we are open and welcoming to all. We need to demonstrate it in our buildings, in the words and deeds of our members, 
in the way we do church activities and programs, and in the way we join together as a religious family. That is the work of radical hospitality. This is actually the second sermon I'm giving on the topic. I am calling this version Radical Hospitality Part U. Because I want to focus on what all of us, the congregation of this great church, can do to make this a truly welcoming church for all people. First off, let's recall what radical hospitality is. As I have come to understand it, radical hospitality has two main components, invitation and inclusion. The invitation part is the structural aspect of welcoming newcomers to the church. It covers such things as how the building appears to people, how accessible it is, how easy it is for people to park their car, find the front entrance, find their way around, seek information, engage their children, or better experience worship. It also includes the systems put in place to help people feel welcome and valued by meeting others in the church. These systems include people like the ushers and the greeters. Radical Invitation asks us to go the extra mile to be sure that our structures help visitors feel comfortable, supported, and encouraged. Inclusion is the second component of radical hospitality and is possibly even more critical. Inclusion is about how we present ourselves to newcomers and how they are treated while they are considering whether or not they will return. Like the scouts of old with whom I tried to fit in, organizations can have unwritten rules of acceptance. No scout could be fully accepted until they wore the uniform, said the oath, followed the rules, acted within certain models of behavior. Many churches have similar silent rules and presumptions. They say, in effect, that you are welcome to become one of us so long as you fulfill our expectations of how we define ourselves. Radical inclusion asks us to be open to the transformation that occurs when someone who is different enters a space and helps to redefine it and ourselves in a new and wonderful way. Radical inclusion begins with the guest and not the host. The newcomer is encouraged to share their stories, their hopes, their challenges, their spiritual journeys while we listen and open our hearts to the experience. This church has some great systems employed to encourage invitation. We have a dedicated, though small, group of people who are exploring ways to increase and deepen our methods of both invitation and inclusion. They are the Hospitality Committee, led by our own F Director of Lifespan Faith Formation, Dolores Heredia Wood, and they want me to let you know this is the commercial. They would love to have more people join them in this important work. That work includes finding and guiding our kind ushers and greeters who also play an important role in welcoming newcomers. But the real work of radical hospitality rests with all of us, the congregation. After all, visitors are looking for a church to join, not a committee, not a team. And we, all of us, are the church. In a truly an invitational and inviting church, everyone is a greeter, an usher, a representative, <laughs> and an ambassador for the community. So now some of you, hopefully all of you, are thinking, what can I do to help visitors feel more welcome and accepted? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because there are three things you can do as visitors come into this space together. One is to take notice. 
second is be attentive, and the third is be curious. I'll say it again. Take notice, be attentive, be curious. To take notice means to always be on the lookout for new people. Hopefully they will be easy to spot because they will be wearing temporary name tags, but not everyone gets a name tag. We come to church partly because we want to spend time with people we know. We can easily get lost in small clusters of friends who share fascinating conversations. That is human nature. But a little vigilance is necessary to remember that there may be people nearby who are not familiar with anyone else in the building. Once a new person is spotted, then it is time to take the second step, which is to be attentive. This step asks that you take a little time to make contact with that visitor. If you are willing to make a connection, then it is time for the third process, and that is to be curious. Instead of overwhelming the newcomer with information, radical inclusion asks us to begin with curiosity. We want to know who they are. We want to hear their story. Questions like, what brought you here? Or, what has been your spiritual journey? Or even, what do you need? Open space for newcomers to bring forward their full self. It lets them know that we are here to listen, rather than to try and convince them of something. It is a chance, as St. Benedict described it, to listen with the ear of the heart. This is radical hospitality, can, and it can be done at different times, such as before a service, during coffee hour, which, by the way, is only possible by several dedicated people who also want me to let you know that you, they would love for you to join them. <laughs> What's more, we have come up with a program where you can practice these skills of observation, attention, and curiosity all together in a safe and supportive environment. Through this program, you can be a significant part of helping to make visitors get to know us. It is called the Ambassador Program. The idea of this program is to connect church members with newcomers who have identified a desire to join the program. The Hospitality Committee will connect a volunteer person or family with a newcomer or guest. The volunteer or ambassador agrees to meet the guest at least once for a meal or other simple gathering where some radical inclu inclusion can be practiced. And then the ambassador makes sure that the guest is able to make connections with people at church, especially at times like coffee hour. Now it is my turn to advertise that I hope you will become a part of the ambassador program. You can do that by emailing me at intern at uuchemsford.org. And I had a set of Ginsu knives here for those who called right now, but I <laughs> seem to have forgotten them. Radical hospitality is about making all people feel welcome and comfortable. People who do not feel welcome because they think, look, act, talk, love, or express themselves differently will walk away. People who are not accepted because they are not seen or heard for who they are will walk away. People who are made to feel that there is no place here for them will walk away. And when people walk away, we fail as Unitarian Universalists to do what our faith calls us to do. As people of faith, encouraging the worth and dignity of every person to shine is not just the right thing to do, it's the righteous thing to do. In the name of that which you hold in your heart to be most sacred, may it be so. <laughs>